high class from about 1000 to 350 BCE. A range of challenges like warfare, political upheaval, economic pressures, and social developments transformed the empires and city-states of Afro-Eurasia. Second-generation societies are going to arise across Afro-Eurasia in a pivotal period sometimes called the Axial Age. And who even knows what the word axial means? It really means a shift or a turn. And what we're going to see is that these Axial Age sinkers in Afro-Eurasia will turn the world inside out and reshape people's views of the world and their place in it. So let's talk about who they are. Class in Afro-Eurasia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the Americas, a large variety of teachers and thinkers are going to emerge as political, social, and spiritual leaders, increasingly occupying the influential roles previously played by kings and priests and warriors. And they're gonna offer a range of proposals for organizing politics and social life, as well as ethically developing individual identities and family life in these diverse times. Now, these intellectual changes take place in the context of profound changes in human affairs. There is incessant warfare consuming the energies of larger populations. Large-scale migrations are still taking place, and new cities are developing. Leaders are motivated to seek new insights to navigate these change. Almost simultaneous, major thinkers with lasting influence live in East Asia, South Asia, and the Eastern Mediterranean. And who are they? We've already talked about Zoroaster and the Jewish prophets. Now we're going to cover Confucius, Siddhartha Gautama, or the Buddha, and Greek philosophers like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Later, we'll be covering Jesus of Nazareth and Muhammad. The system of thought that they promoted inspires individual belief systems, but also is a response to and influential in politics and economic institutions. So in all of these intellectual developments, leaders are establishing order amid considerable change and uncertainty. But these ideas of these axial age thinkers sprawl beyond the palaces and places where they're generated and influence a broader population. Sort of a war of ideas begins to emerge and it really is a pivotal time in human history when we begin questioning individual existence and the meaning of life. Class, let me read you a few quotes from each of these thinkers and you tell me, do they all draw the same conclusion about life and who we are and what we should do? And are we still asking these same questions? Okay, Zoroaster we talked about previously um, and Zoroastrianism, he says good thoughts, good words, and good deeds. Uh, Confucius says, everything has beauty, but not everyone sees it. The Buddha says this, three things can't long be hidden, the sun, the moon, and the truth. Socrates says, this is my favorite quote by Socrates, I cannot teach anyone anything, I can only make them think. Ezekiel, one of the prophets that we mentioned, said this, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his ways and live. And Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And he also said this, which is interesting, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. And finally, from Muhammad, he says this, show forgiveness, enjoy kindness, and avoid ignorance. And I really like this quote from Muhammad, humanity is but a single brotherhood, so make peace with your brother. The age of these great ideas and these thinkers are gonna produce debate over what is going to be best for humanity. We're gonna start though in China and we're gonna take a look at the political and the military context of the Eastern Zhou society in China and it enables a number of new thinkers to promote systems of thought amid a very broad cultural flourishing and then we're gonna see the rise of the Qin Dynasty. 
Now, during the spring and autumn period, uh, between about 720 and 481 BCE, there were about seven large territorial states that came to dominate um, in China, and they replaced a more centralized, unified government. And there's these political units that are engaged in battles among themselves, as well as internal wars and civil wars. And this is about a 250-year period. And these conflicts are exacerbated by these huge infantries that are being created, these huge armies and innovations in iron smelting, which will lead to less expensive but more deadly weapons like the crossbow. And this proliferation of weapons enables local authorities to accumulate more power away from that centralized government, therefore weakening them. Now, this warfare in China is going to spill over into um, a period of time called the Warring States period from 403 BCE until 221 BCE. And in this period, those seven major territorial states coalesce into an eastern Zhou world, but by 221 BCE, the Qin state is going to come out on top and replace the Zhou dynasty. Now, the Qin state is going to be the first imperial dynasty in China, and they're going to greatly influence all of the other imperial dynasties to come. Despite warfare during this time, you're going to see scholars, scholarship and merchants are going to thrive in the midst of an expanding economy. And the first ruler during this time, or the first emperor, was Qin Shi Huangdi. And political organization and control was paramount to Emperor Qin's and he is going to maintain a centralized bureaucratic government. All men had to register for the army or public labor. He also conscripted people from the, from the outer lands and brought them into work. He ignored nobility and he ruled alone. He took over regional military units and he was known for a massive public works project like 4,000 miles of road and linking all of the walls built against nomadic invasions. This is going to become known as the Great Wall of China. He had a system of strict laws and punishments and he was not very popular. In order to assert his authority, Emperor Qin ordered all books on philosophy, ethics, history, and literature to be burned. Okay were books on medicine, fortune-telling, and agriculture, and he also spared the official history of the Qin state. Class 460 scholars were buried alive or placed into dangerous military posts. Fortunately, many books were hidden and restored after his reign, but we know most about uh, the Emperor Qin because of his massive, lavish tomb discovered in 1974. It's really rare to find such a complete tomb. Inside, they find these sacrificed slaves, sacrificed concubines. Even those who built the tomb were sacrificed and enshrined inside. I am not sure who would sign up for that job. His resting place was protected by traps and crossbows triggered to kill intruders, and it was guarded by an entire army of terracotta soldiers, 15,000 in all. The first emperor's reign is going to end on a bad note after his death when a million or so workers he had forced into labor to work on his projects began to rebel and they overwhelmed the Qin courts and killed many government officials and they had their own little barbecue and it really dissolves in chaos. But his legacy is that he greatly expanded the size of the Chinese state, unified many diverse territorial sites within China, and it was one of the longest running imperial systems in world history. His death was noted in 210 BCE, despite his infamous search for the elixir of immortality. This is uh, the Zhou China um, warring states. They're a map of, of their borders. And class, this is a Chinese calendar. Uh, this, this calendar is from 63 BCE. The Chinese developed the calendar and it's formed from 16 slips of wood and each begins with day one, day two, and so on. And the calendar is to be read from right to left. Now, in China, during this time, 
There were many itinerant type scholars who sought to influence the course of human affairs. And these philosophies in China are referred to as the hundred schools of thought by the hundred masters. And often the individuals who developed these philosophies had lost status in a political um, elite, or they had consequently sought to regain their sat status through service as a thinker. So they were very much products of the political context at the time and contributed to its development. Confucius is going to emerge from the tumultuous political time of the spring and autumn period, where he held a handful of minor government positions but never could really advance the way he wanted to. And at the origin of the Zhou Dynasty, he perceives the idea of what is a good government and how should it look. However, he's going to be troubled by these rivalries and warfare of the era, and he believed in the idea of an enlightened ruler who could transcend all of this turmoil. He believed that the Junzi is a superior gentleman who should rule China, following the values of Ren, which means kindness, and Li, which is appropriate behavior, and Zhao, which is filial piety. He believed that it was an individual's nature to behave justly and that these natural inclinations should lead to a harmonious existence and social relations. Toward this end, he's going to promote standards for both political and individual behavior that were related to each other. For example, the model of the patriarchal family based on submission and loyalty would also serve as a model for the state. Rulers would respect the will of the heaven as if it were a father figure, remember the mandate of heaven, and protect its subjects as if they were children. Meanwhile, family life would be based on respect for male elders and loyalty. Education was highly valued by Confucius and central to all of this for men. In government, individuals would be promoted based on merit and moral character rather than birth. He believed that this would form the basis of a harmonious, non-coercive society. Now, his beliefs were transmitted by his followers and his 77 core disciples in the Analects. He didn't leave anything written, but they wrote it down for him. Unfortunately, Confucius is no friend to the woman. He supported a very patriarchal society where women are to be led and follow others. One of Confucius' quotes is a particularly painful one, and I'm going to quote it here. He said this, A woman should look on her husband as if he were heaven himself and never weary of thinking how she may yield to him. His writings are going to have an extraordinary influence on scholars and government officials who come after him. And according to Confucius, relations between the superior and the inferior are like that between the wind and the grass. Grass must bend when the wind blows it. Now, contrary to much of Confucian thought, Taoism is also going to emerge in this period. And this philosophy is attributed to Lao Tzu or Master Lao, who, if you know, as a historical figure, would have been a contemporary of Confucius. And his sayings were gathered in the 3rd century BCE in the Book of the Way and its power. And he stressed Tao, or the Way, which is a sharp contrast to Confucian thought in the Analects. Taoism opposes strict rituals and a ritual social hierarchy of system of thought. Instead, it instructs individuals and leaders to follow the natural order through the guiding principle of Wu Wei, which roughly means doing nothing, but although this principle applied to individuals' conduct, it's also a political philosophy on both levels. Acceptance and non-interference in the world were emphasized rather than forcefully trying to control events. Now, for realers, this meant that the idea was a certain detachment from the attempt to manage change. And as for individuals, it means that spontaneity rather than rigid rules and harmony with nature rather than conflict with it were crucial. Contrary to Confucian thought, individuals should seek freedom from rules of society rather than strict conformity with them. 
Ironically, many over the centuries have carefully studied both Confucianism and Taoism, and this made China unique as scholars and state were inseparable and created a lasting tradition. And I also want to mention another form of thought during this time called legalism. It's also called hard-headed philosophy, and neither Confucianism or Taoism can answer or solve all of China's problems, right? So the writings of Zheng Ji and Han Fei said, ethics and morality, forget those, forget nature and a harmonious life, they are going to forge most of the laws governing legalism. According to Han Fei, and I quote, if rewards are high, then what the ruler wants will be quickly affected. If punishments are heavy, what he does not want will be swiftly prevented. So it was a pessimistic view of nature and believed that the two strengths of the state that should always be supported are agricultural efforts and the military. These are the only two in society that performs essential functions. No emperor would openly advocate legalism, but it was embraced nonetheless. And I also want to briefly mention the emblem at the top of my slide called yin yang. Class, this is a Chinese philosophy that develops over time describing how apparently opposite or contrary forces are actually complementary. They're interconnected and interdependent in the natural world. Dualities such as light and dark, fire and water, male and female are the physical manifestations of yin and yang. And this duality lies at the origins of many branches of classical Chinese science, philosophy, and thought. And it's really come to mean many things to many people. Okay, so let's talk about a new way of thinking in South Asia. Jainism. It's based on the writings of Vardhamana Mahavira. And at, at age 30, he leaves home seeking salvation. And he leads an ascetic life, wandering along where he gained enlightenment. And he believed that we should practice ahimsa, which means no hurt. Everything in the universe possesses a soul. Humans, animals, plants, water, rocks. Only with purification from selfish behavior could you save your soul and shed bad karma. Janus are devout, nonviolent vegetarians, and monks will sweep the ground before they walk so as not to kill insects. It's very demanding religion, and few can adhere to it. But according to some scholars, Jainism has inspired people like Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr., I thought you might find this chart interesting. It's showing the world's major religions class. And as you can see, Christianity, Islam, and then Buddhism, uh, Hinduism are the top three today. The next uh, major axial age thinker from this time is going to be Siddhartha Gautama, later known as the Buddha or the enlightened one. His teachings directly challenged the major Brahmin beliefs, as well as their insistence on a bloody ritual sacrifices that we've talked about already, and a promotion of a kingship system that keeps their priestly, clower, uh, priestly class in power. Instead, Siddhartha Gautama elaborated a system that is captured in the Four Noble Truths which he arrived after a long period of reflection, having left behind his privileged upbringing in a small community. He says this, I teach but one thing. Life from birth to death is full of suffering. All sufferings are caused by desires, and the only way to rise above suffering is to renounce your desires. Only through adherence to an eightfold path can individuals rid themselves of desire and the illusion of a separate identity and thus reach a state of contentment called nirvana. This new system of thought really appealed to non-Brahmins because it both removed those Brahmin deities and rituals from your spiritual life, but because it was logical and easily accessible to a broader population. The community of followers most drawn to this message formed a group of monks known as the Gathering. And this group wandered across the Ganges Plain, spreading his messages and receiving alms to survive. So again, he rejects religious authority, 
He's not really interested in creation or gods. He suggests individuals should take responsibility for their own spiritual growth. He rejects Varna or the caste system because he says anyone can be enlightened. And I thought this was interesting class. At first, Buddha rejected women as monks, but later he develops a separate order for women and thousands of women flocked to the Buddhist order of monks. Now remember women during this time in India were subject to their father, later their husbands, and if their husband passed away, uh, women were never to be independent, it would be passed on to their sons. So according to the Buddhist nuns, they were delighted to be free from three crooked things, mortar, pestle, and husband. And they said this, I am free from birth to death and all that dragged me back. So this is the Noble Eightfold Path of Buddhism. Um, right insight, right thought, right speech, action, livelihood, effort, mindfulness, and meditation. Buddha did not start out as a god or a deity, and he was reluctant to make himself into an idol, so footprints were the early representations of Buddha. And finally, class, I want to uh, talk about Hinduism. Um, it's just the religion of the majority of people today in India and Nepal, and it also exists among a significant population outside of the subcontinent and has over 900 million adherents worldwide today. Um, it is the world's third largest religion, like I mentioned, and in some ways Hinduism is the oldest living religion in the world because it has at least elements that stretch back many thousand years. Um, and it's also today viewed as just a way of life, not only a religion. And it's really been influenced by the writings of some of the things that we've talked about, the Vedas, the Upanishads, and other ancient writings in India. Now, within Hinduism, there's no single founder, there's no single type of scripture, there's no commonly agreed set upon teachings, but one of the influences of Hindu Hinduism is also the Law Book of Manu, and it deals with proper moral behavior. And it was a text for gurus or teachers to study and relate about karma, reincarnation, and samsara. Remember, reincarnation is the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. Hindus believe that's influenced by karma or how we live our life. And today, um, and it influences our cycle of death and rebirth or reincarnation called samsara. Now, as you can imagine, the law book of Manu strengthens a patriarchal society. Women are would be were to be treated with honor, but women must also be subject to the principal man in their life. Remember, father, husband, son. Um, another um, interesting thing from this is an Indian custom that emerged during this time, and that's the custom of sati. A woman would throw herself on her deceased husband's funeral pyre. Now, class, the British will outlaw this in 1829 when they ruled in India. Unfortunately, there are still some accounts of sati during the 20th century. And I'm going to take a, a moment and pause here, and I'll pick back up in just a moment. <music> 